Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson, and the nightlight is on for Friday, April 5th, 2024. You know, yesterday on the show, we talked about how much more united Americans are than we give ourselves credit for. And one of the things we do come together for are the movies. One of my absolute favorite channels is Turner Classic Movies, TCM. It's celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, and there's something about the fandom around this kind of film that I think has something to say about how much we really have in common. So, tonight you're gonna hear my conversation with Primetime TCM host, Ben Mankiewicz. And I would love to get your questions and thoughts in the chat. Remember, you can find all my links at nightlightjoshua.com or email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. Great to be with you this evening. I hope you've had a good week. Thanks to all of you who have followed the show regularly on YouTube. If you're new to the program, you can subscribe on my YouTube channel. I am at Nightlight Joshua. You can also watch on Facebook or Twitch or X, but YouTube is where all the cool kids hang out, including <laughs> Pam. You know, Pam, I got to start with your comment. I got to start with what you wrote in the chat, just because it, 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 it made me chuckle. Pam wrote, so between the long hours at work and the nightlight, my hubby is getting very little of my attention. I told him, I can watch the rebroadcast and we can watch TV together. His reply was, no, hockey's on at seven. Goofy man was pretending to sound neglected, LOL. Look, Pam, uh, I appreciate your fandom of the show. I'm not trying to catch no case from a, a, a jilted husband. So if you need to watch the show later on, the same YouTube link will bring you right back to this broadcast. I just don't want to be waking up on a, a Saturday morning and I all of a sudden have to answer the door and be like, you know my wife, Pam, and be like, I don't, I don't know, nobody, I just, I just got to this planet. So I'm glad that you are loyal to the show though. I am delighted that you are here. He can watch with you, perhaps, or maybe you, uh, maybe, 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 maybe if he can be patient for this, that you can watch hockey with him next time. Hockey school, Vegas Golden Knights are doing their thing. I don't know if he's a Golden Knights fan or not. I just don't want to get beat up by your husband. That's all I'm saying, Pam, because I'm, I'm, I'm delicate. A bruise like a grape. I also see Susan in the chat, who apparently does not have any uh, relatives that I'm taking her away from. Hello, happy Friday to you, Susan. Solange the first, hello, good to see you as well. Uh, also, uh, I see your comment, Solange, asking if anybody felt the 4.8 earthquake today. Jean, hello, good to have you. I saw you got some of the trembling in Maryland. Glad that everybody is okay, though. Susan, hello, I see you did not get any shaking in Pennsylvania. I, uh, I, I'm glad that everybody was okay from that. As soon as I saw that there was an earthquake, in New York, I got very, very worried because New York's not really built for earthquakes. But I think the merciful thing is that that New York tri-state area, particularly the city of Manhattan, is built for a lot of like ground vibration because there's always big trucks bouncing up and down and the subway runs underneath everywhere. So it seemed like a lot of people were sort of like, did you feel that? What was that? Did you feel that? As opposed to an honest to God like <laughs> earthquake where you know the earth is moving. In New York, it's just kind of like a light rumble. So. I don't know if that says more about the mildness of the earthquake or the intensity of New Yorkers, but either way, I'm glad that people were all right from that. Joseph, hello. Good to see you as well. Dark Forever Clear. I'm glad you found that funny. So thank you for being here. Welcome to everybody who is watching. And to those of you who may be watching for the first time to see my conversation with Ben, welcome. I'm Joshua. This is The Nightlight. Our show deals largely with issues of connection, particularly as it relates to the future of democracy. Democracy is all about the ways in which we try to connect to build a better life and solve problems and create a society. And one of the big things that we talk about on this show, and those of you who watch have heard me talk about this and or rant about this, are the things that pull us apart, but also the lack of emphasis on the things that actually bring us together. On yesterday's show, if you missed it, I talked about some of the latest polling data that illuminate how much more Americans have in common than we think, and some of the ways in which pollsters, some of them, are beginning to ask different kinds of questions to illuminate the actual extent of our polarization. I feel like we can't really have the conversation about this country unless we talk about it in those terms too. I mean, if you go to your doctor and say, I broke my wrist, 
and they try to do surgery on your entire arm, you'd be upset. However, we're trying to deal with issues in this country that are significant, but we don't know the full extent of them. We know how much is broken. We don't really have a clear picture on how much is still strong. And that's what I think we need to fix. I think we need that clearer picture all the way around. I love the fact that so many people in our audience are fans of something I'm a fan of, which is Turner Classic Movies. Movies are one of the primary connecting points for lots and lots of people. And this year is the 30th anniversary of TCM. It went on the air on April 14th, 1994. The very first film that TCM showed was Gone with the Wind, which was the favorite movie of its founder, Ted Turner. Robert Osborne was the longtime host of TCM until he died several years ago. The longest tenured host now is Ben Mankiewicz, who's been there since 2003. He and I taped a conversation this week, and that is what you're going to hear tonight. I've broken it into three parts. I hope you'll please share your thoughts, questions, comments, reactions in the chat, stories about TCM, or even about the themes that we brought up. Whether you agree with what Ben has to say or not, I would love to hear from you in the chat on whatever platform you're watching on, and I, we will get to some of your comments as the program goes on. Remember before I start part one of the interview to please, if you are enjoying the program, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button so that you'll be able to get notifications about future episodes of The Night Light when they come up, and in case I do some impromptu chats, which I do put together every now and then. All right, so let's get into it. Here is part one of my conversation with TCM primetime host, Ben Mankiewicz. I will keep an eye on your comments in the chat. Ben Mankiewicz, welcome to The Nightlight. I'm so glad to have you on. Thanks for having me. I'm, 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 I'm very grateful. Appreciate it. I think a lot of us are grateful for TCM and for what TCM does. And I want to talk about that in a few different contexts. But first of all, 30 years of TCM, of a channel that I think kind of at the beginning, some folks weren't quite sure if it was going to last, if people were going to be interested in it, if cable operators wanted to take it. How do you think TCM made it this far? Well, I mean, I think that, that because that question got answered by, yeah, there are people who want it and will support it and cable operators who want it, cable operators who've, uh, you know, against our desires have moved it on to even a, a higher tier to make people, you know, pay more for it, which uh, we do not want. Um, so, no, there was a great appetite for it. I mean, and, you know, I. I don't think it's surprising. I mean, it's only surprising because we've been having this conversation uh, for 30 years and, and the conversation over the importance of of movies from the classic era for longer than 30 years, of course. And I mean, no one would take seriously the argument that like, well, I, nobody needs to read uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye anymore. We don't, you know, what, 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 why are we still reading John Steinbeck? Let's take those out of the library. Those are old books. Nobody cares about those books anymore. I mean, it's ridiculous. So it's equally ridiculous with movies. How do you define a classic movie these days? I was I, going through the TCM section of the app Max, which TCM's kind of folded into. And I saw the movie Starship Troopers in there, which came out in the mid 90s and i was like damn it <laughs> how is that well, a classic movie now but but there's also a new video game out called hell divers 2 which is perfectly styled to starship troopers and as the game came out people began to look up starship troopers because they wanted to know the reference and i wonder if that's one of the distinguishing characteristics of a classic movie that it becomes a reference a touchstone there's like another generation that goes oh i think i need to know this exists well, you've given one of the many very acceptable answers for what is a classic film. I mean, you know, does it, it because it takes on some over some period of time, an undefined period of time, it takes on some form of cultural relevance, right? Um, I'm not copping out on this answer at all. There is no right answer for what is a classic movie. And that's that suits us very well because it allows us to program largely anything we want right i mean the the first slogan 30 years ago for this channel before it even went on the air uh was the best movies of all time all the time there was no era uh ascribed to that it was the best movies of all time all the time um 
over time, because of the our ability to get movies and what was in our library, what was in the library that Ted Turner had acquired and then what we added was really to put it, make it easiest to digest to an audience, to the audience listening to, to our conversation, Joshua, was the was that, you know, our wheelhouse was the 1930s, 40s and 50s. We could get those movies. I mean, we would love to have shown The Godfather all, uh, often on TCM, but it cost a lot of money. You know, so would Jaws. And so, of course, would the, you know, the modern superhero movies of today. Right. We don't have any. There's no mission statement that says that we can't show those movies. Right. It's just that they're very expensive. Right. There's a there's a much more robust marketplace for those movies. We became the guardians of these movies. Uh, plenty from the 60s, plenty from the 70s, certainly silent films from from the early part of the 1920s and the teens. But the 30s, 40s, and 50s probably made up, I'm making this number up, but 85% of the movies that we showed, somewhere between 85 to 90, 80 to 90 anyway. Um, you know, as time has gone on, we've certainly added more movies from the 70s, or, uh, 60s as well. We get a lot from the 60s, certainly. Um, and, you know, when we can, movies from the 80s, 90s, and, and into the 21st century. There is no rule about what makes a classic. Sometimes, I mean, I think everyone at TCM would acknowledge that there are some movies that come out and you're like, well, that's an instant classic, right? I mean, uh, here, let's just, I, uh, I'll take the two most obvious movies from, from 2023, Barbie and Oppenheimer. Yeah. Those are classics right away. There's no, you know, if we can show, we can show Barbie and Oppenheimer next year. We will. I'm gonna, but we're not gonna be able to. Right. <laughs> so we don't well, have that much money, right? Well, I think one of the things that that also you talk about cultural relevance. One of the things that I think makes a movie a classic is just frankly that there's an appreciation of people that you noticed it. I feel like one of the sure, things right. that sort of goes with a classic in terms of that cultural relevance is a feeling of being seen, of being validated for your love of something that touched you personally and someone else is able to acknowledge it, see it, put it in a context and say, you're right, this actually did matter. It didn't just matter to you, it matters in a bigger sense and that kind of enlarges and ennobles you as a fan. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Um, we, in addition, that's, you know, you, you, but in, in that very question, you see the difficulty in answering what makes a classic right there's no there is no year marker there's no formal delineation nor do we nor are we interested in a formal delineation right uh what has happened wonderfully with the channel with turner classic movies over the last 30 years is we became you know i don't want to overstate it but let's as we, as we became culturally relevant ourselves in part not because we're so great i think we are but but because we're the ones who have taken on this job Right. There were some other channels that did it in the beginning. AMC was doing it when we went into business, but they checked out of that business. They still make some great, great television there, but they don't show classic movies and they certainly don't show them uncut and commercial free. So we became the guardians of classic Hollywood. And then what happened was this this wonderful thing about we try to answer that question. What's a classic that we became part of the answer? Like, well, they showed it on TCM. <laughs> So therefore, it's a classic. Must be a classic, it's a nice, right? It, right. It's a nice place to be to be the arbiter of that. But there are, of course, plenty of classic films that we not not plenty. We we have a really big library, and and we don't just show movies in our library. We to get to that cost issue, we we have a huge budget. The biggest our biggest expenditure by far is not on is not on people or studios. It's on acquiring movies that we can then show on the air. We what's called licensing. We get them for a certain period of time, maybe to show once, maybe we'll get to show it three times or four times in a year or four times in two years. I don't, I don't make those deals, of course. Um, uh, but the, you know, so we have a, we have access to a tremendous number of movies. Um, and then by their very nature, they, they are there. I think their status is, uh, juiced you know, when, uh, when they appear on TCM, which is really, really nice. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about TCM is because one of the big themes of the nightlight is democracy connection, the things that kind of bring us together and the things that pull us apart. And I feel like there's something to the nature of classic movies as a cultural touchstone that helps us to sort of mark who we are as a country and as a people today compared to the past. I mean, one of the the bits of backstory to TCM that I found interesting was the T in TCM, Ted Turner, 
who made a lot of people very, very angry with the way that he dealt with classic movies. I mean, one of the, the clips that I found just kind of in digging back was back from 1986, well before the channel went on the air, where he defended his purchase of the MGM Film Library. Among other things, he said, the last time I checked, I owned the films that were in the process of colorizing. I can do whatever I want with them, and if they're gonna be shown on television, they're gonna be in color. He bought them, of course, not just purely for preservation's sake, but because he wanted to put them on television. And one of the things that kind of was remarkable to me is how right he was to acquire them, but how wrong he apparently was to try to colorize black and white movies. Among other things in this LA Times write-up, he said, I'm colorizing Casablanca just for controversy's sake. Once people start watching the colored version, they won't bother with the original. I feel... Ben, like that was just amazingly Ted Turner-esque of him, just kind of the brashness and the fact that he was right to acquire them, but wrong to try to colorize them and people really punched back kind of speaks to what some of these movies mean in a deeper way to sort of understanding who we are, I guess, or who we were at that point. So life is complicated, right? And Ted Turner's no longer uh, affiliated with the channel. I mean, his name's there and it'll be there forever. So I don't owe him anything. I don't work for him. Uh, he's a genius and we owe this channel to him. Um, and his vision for this business is unparalleled, right? I mean, he really saw what this business could be. And the reason he acquired these movies is because he loved watching them. And he, here's where our maybe one similarity he didn't think he was exceptional. I don't think I'm exceptional, which is a good, it's a good arbiter of what I, when I try to figure out what I should say on the air, I'm like, well, if I think this is interesting, other people probably will because I'm fairly ordinary, right? In many ways. Um, and he thought these movies are worth something and, and they're inexpensive and nobody's paying for them. And, and, but people will watch this and they don't cost us anything. If once we get them, then we can just show them. So he's the one who saw a real value in this. He's the he's the leader who saw real value in this. There certainly were others, but he was the guy at the top of the food chain who recognized that this was valuable. And if you you ask him today what his two weakest we have, what his two proudest accomplishments in in what is a what has been a remarkable life, uh, what his pr two proudest business accomplishments were, it would be starting CNN and starting TCM. So I don't I don't even need to equivocate on that. That guy's amazing. Um, I wish I knew him better. Uh, colorizing movies, in his mind, was all about getting a generation that balked at black and white to see these great movies. So he may have been wrong, but his intent was entirely pure, 100%. So if he was wrong, it was just a misreading of the of, of who that marketplace was. I mean, and 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 what that marketplace wanted and that he didn't do that very often. And to his eternal credit, he did it for a while. And then he was like, all right, okay, you win. <laughs> My bad. Right. We'll fix it. And, yeah. we'll keep, and we'll keep showing it. I mean, we're going to tell a great story coming up this month on the air about the, the Brad Siegel, who was the first guy who ran TCM for him. And he and Ted made a deal because Brad was resistant to colorization. Right. And he was like, no, look, man, if you're going to start a movie channel that shows all the best movies all the time, right, the greatest movies of all time, all the time, going back to that slogan, Brad said to him, and if you're going to and our whole thing is going to be we're going to show them uncut and commercial free, we cannot turn a black and white film into color. We cannot put that on the air if that's going to be our mantra. And so Ted was like, OK. And Brad also at that point ran TNT, which was the first channel of his to show these movies. Uh, with commercials because that's tnt's business model they have to have commercials um and so ted was like all right fine you guys get the black and white ones and we'll keep showing the color ones on tnt and brad was like great have at it Good deal uh and you know and then over time it, it turned out that people did not want to see casablanca in color i i you know I don't either. I don't want the movies changed. I can't even imagine watching Casablanca in color. That would feel. Well, I've seen. I've seen it. I've seen it. I don't remember. You know, I don't remember. I saw the whole thing. I, I definitely saw it in, in in color during as that was happening. Maybe I just saw part of it. I don't know. My memory's so bad now. But so, 
you know, the technology, you know, we, we, we saw, you know, Peter, Peter Jackson's amazing uh, picture about that, that turned all that, that civil war footage when they were young. I'm, I'm butchering the title while they were still young, uh, but it was world war one. And then they managed to like read lips and, and create the audio around these, 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 this black and white film and they colorized it. And there's been a lot of colorization of world war two footage. And it's kind of amazing. Um, because it makes it more vibrant. It brings it more to life. There was color then, right? Those planes attacked Pearl Harbor on a bright, sunny day, right? It looks different in color. Um, is that, uh, excuse me, I can't, I literally cannot figure out my cell phone anymore. I'm totally, I'm incapable That's right. of figuring out it's, it's amazing. it's on. I don't. It's amazing. I can stream with you from the second bedroom in my apartment with this technology, but still I will leave my cell phone on in the middle of the show and people will be like, ah, you, you, Mr. High Tech. So I, I can totally- Why do they really use the word- haptics as if that's a word that any living human being has ever used in a conversation or understand you know why because it adds 125 dollars to the retail price that's why they use because if you just said it vibrates it doesn't you can't you can't make money off of something that is that simply like yeah. you can feel Maybe. it it doesn't it doesn't work that way you got to make it it i you know what just it color is it? Why can't you just keep it simple? Show it the way that it was. Well, because because you can make money off of it. And to the point you were making, there, as I was prepping to talk to you about this, I did not realize that after the hue and cry over Ted Turner adding hues to movies, there was a congressional hearing. Like the Senate Judiciary Committee got involved in talking about film preservation. Sidney Pollack testified, Woody Allen testified, and I wanna play a clip of Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire's famous dancing partner, testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee. She was talking about the colorization of 42nd Street, which came out in her early 30s. Busby Berkeley directed the dance sequences, she was in it, and she talks about her disgust at seeing the way the technology of the day colorize the movie. Here is part of what Ginger Rogers testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Can you accurately color a Busby Berkeley chorus line of a hundred beautiful girls with their arms, legs, and costumes twirling? The answer is you can't, and you shouldn't try. And all these lovely girls in 42nd Street suddenly had the same orange face, the same orange legs, the same green costume, and the same blank look. Actors have already suffered many indignities through the unbridled exploitation of our popular films. Our names, our voices, our faces are considered grist for the mills of commerce. But a motion picture is more than just a strip of celluloid. It is the blood, sweat, and tears of hundreds of artists. It is our energy and ambition, imagination, I mean, and captured by the camera. When it is chopped or colored or clipped, well, so am I. This computerized cartoon coloring is the final indignity. It is the destruction of all I have worked to achieve. We must fight it with all of our might. We must not let computers casually redesign our cultural heritage. Then I wonder if maybe in what she said, there's something of what these movies mean to us culturally, that when you change them, you kind of change us, you change the story of who we are, and we can't have that. Yeah, it was very well written by uh, uh, Ginger, whether she wrote it or not. She knew what she was saying, and she was obviously very smart. Uh, I would, I would I'll correct you on one thing, just because if you were speaking to one of the other TCM hosts, Alicia Malone, uh, she would definitely refer to Fred Astaire as Ginger Rogers' as dance part. I beg your um, pardon. The, uh, um, See what I but, did? Uh, See what I did? It's so easy. But I, I, uh, I apologize no, to all who may have but, possibly no, 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 benefited, no, no, but thank you for that. I'm, I'm messing with you. You're That's okay. Right. Of course. That, um, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, backwards and in heels, right? She had to do everything he did, but backwards and in heels. So, uh, but she was really, the, it goes to what the point I was making earlier. And by the way, that Peter Jackson uh, movie was a psycho when they were young. It was a much better title. Uh, they Shall Not Grow Old. And and it was really quite something. Um, and And I'm sure the technology is even better since then. So part of what is in that Ginger Rogers speech there in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee was it the Judiciary Committee? 
Like what did that? What were that? What was their role in this? Were it was the Senate Judiciary somebody? Committee. This was, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, Patrick Leahy was on it. He has been with the take, Senate since they yeah, built that take, thing, and they were right. they were doing a hearing about this because after Ted Turner bought the library, there was this uproar from Hollywood, and they called all these folks from Hollywood to testify, and that no, that I actually just, led I mean, to the bill that created the like National the, Film Registry. Uh, eventually, right, a few the, years later, I just imagine that would be the Commerce Committee or something. It's just weird that it's the judiciary. Judiciary, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, I grew up in D.C. I'm a political junkie. Uh, but anyway, so the the uh, part of what Ginger Rogers was complaining about was not just the uh, sort of uh, stealing from history, right? The theft of 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 their own history, and and you know, in general, our shared history. But for her, her own history, right? Was was that it was bad, and that all oh, they all had the same orange hue. Well. Look, you're, I, I, I pray that this doesn't turn into a clip where the TCM host comes on and says we should revisit colorizing films. I don't think we should. But guess what? It would be better now. It would be good. It would be probably great. And it would probably represent those colors uh, accurately. And, you know, I've seen Casablanca. I'm going to try not to exaggerate 35 times, probably start to finish. Right. I'd watch it once in color if it were good. I would. No question. I'd be like, oh, that's really cool. Look how different Bogey looks in color. Look how different Paul Henry looks. Look at Claude Rains's face in color. You know, certainly look at Ingrid Bergman in color. So I don't know, man. I um, I I I uh, uh, I think it, I think we're <laughs> uh, the first of all, technology is here, and that what we can do with it when it's good, it's amazing. When it's bad, it's frightening. Um, but. Uh, uh, Ted Turner was too early. And I think based on, as you listen to Ginger Rogers there in 1987, uh, you get a sense of, of what would have happened if we'd waited 15 years for this, 20 years for this, 30 years for it. Right. And, and the product had not been so easy to dismiss as gauche and gaudy and, and, and clearly not representative of how it looked then. Anyway, work, it's not going to happen, and, and TCM is certainly going to lead the fight to, to, to keep it from happening, and I don't think there's a movement to do it now. Like, there's nobody out there desperate to show these movies in color. Part of learning about these movies and appreciating their history is seeing them as they were at the time. And, and the black and white photography, you know, in, in many of the films is, is, is extraordinary. I mean, what they could do with the limitations of uh, of black and white was really invent a, a, a way to take pictures to to show things and 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 to and to to showcase these films uh for audiences um and and that to me more than the actors or actresses is taken away from the work of these brilliant cinematographers working hand in hand with directors to create these these beautiful black and white images you are watching my conversation with TCM primetime host Ben Mankiewicz. Glad to have those of you in the chat sharing your questions and thoughts, including about the first movie TCM ever showed, which was Gone with the Wind. Dark Forever Clear wrote on YouTube, years ago, I saw Gone with the Wind on TCM. Longest movie ever. I questioned anyone after that who said the Lord of the Rings trilogy was too long. Scarlet is one of my least favorite characters ever. I hear you on that. I uh, ooh, let's fix that text. I hear you on that. I think that uh, one of the joys, oh yikes, one of the joys of being able to watch a movie like that is that you get a different feel for those characters. But I don't think Scarlet was supposed to be likable. Although I do also love the fact that it was available to watch in a medium like TCM. That you have a space where you can come away from it and make your own decision about being able to appreciate the film but not necessarily being able to love all the characters within it. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, I wanna play the next part of our conversation where we get deeper into the ways in which TCM as a community has kind of given people a way to cut across some of their differences. Political differences are kind of one of the big ones. Ben referred to the political mix of TCM's audience. You might be surprised at his answer. We'll get more into that. I will get to some of your comments. And I want to show you a document from early in TCM's life, the mantra that they wrote to lay out their mission for Turner Classic Movies. That's all coming up when we come back.
This is The Nightlight. I'm Joshua Johnson. Good to be with you. Remember, you can go to nightlightjoshua.com to find all of my online links, including all of my social media links. You can subscribe to the podcast there, including the video version of this podcast, which is currently available on Spotify, working on making it available on Apple Podcasts. I am working on that. Also, you can subscribe to my Substack for more of my original essays and articles. Speaking of movies, I wrote a piece not too long ago about the upcoming film Civil War and what I hope is not a gigantic plot hole in the film. I'm going to go see Civil War next week on Thursday. I hope you let me know what you think of it if you do go see it, but you can subscribe to my Substack for more of my articles. You can also find the merch store there for Nightlight merch and the ever popular Gullible Ain't Sexy t-shirt. You can also find an online tip jar to drop a few dollars in if you enjoy the program and want to show your support. And you can contact me through the website or you can just email me joshua at nightlightshow.com. No matter what it is that you do, I do hope that you will subscribe to my YouTube channel at Nightlight Joshua. If you're enjoying this live stream, please click the like button, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Let me get into the chat. <clears throat> I would like to get to one comment from a viewer on X. Noah, if you are still there, give me just a second. I want to make sure it lays out fully on the screen. It's a long comment, but that's perfectly all right. Noah on X writes, how do you see, and I wonder if maybe you guys can answer this question too. How do you see the medium of film evolving as a cultural touchstone in light of video games, social media, Twitch streams, everything else, continuing to increase in both popularity and storytelling ability? Can films still be as impactful on society going forward? Barbie and Oppenheimer, and Top Gun 2 to an extent, suggest so, but they seem like outliers over the past few years. Also, I wonder if this question was asked during the rise of TV, home video, etc. Noah, that is an extremely cogent question, and I'm really glad that you asked it. Again, this is a taped conversation with Ben, so I'm sorry that he is not here to answer this. But maybe some of you who are watching on YouTube might have an answer for this too. How do you see the medium of film evolving as a cultural touchstone? We talk about that a bit in the conversation. I do think that there are certain things about movies that are very unique in terms of the scope, in terms of the immersiveness, in terms of the fact that they are designed to be kind of sunk into in a more passive, receptive, long-term way, as opposed to a video game, which you kind of immerse in in a very active long-term way if you want to play for hours, which I do very often. But I think that being able to tell one story over time can be a really wonderful thing. I think that I'm less worried about the future of movies in terms of that sort of immersion because of the popularity of concerts. I think if you're willing to go to the movies or go to an arena to watch Taylor Swift for three hours, and you're willing to go to the movies to watch Taylor Swift for three hours, that means people may still have an appetite for long form content, entertainment or whatever. I think if the movie is really good, it finds an audience. I think in an era of like Squid Game, you can put an audience anywhere in front of something great and they can find it. I think movies like Everything Everywhere All at Once show how much more opportunity there is to tell all kinds of different stories. And it isn't easy in terms of the cinema business, but in terms of movies, I think there's, I think that there's a future there. I also can't help but wonder if younger adults, particularly who have grown up with this screen instead of just the silver screen, are not eventually going to start to wonder why their entertainment experiences feel so much more flaky and superficial than their parents did, if they're even aware, if they even understand like, oh, things are different now, but they feel this way and they feel kind of like shallow and I wish I felt more depth. Well, you know what? There was entertainment years ago that was hours long and people got lost in the story. What was that like? I think there is still room for that. And I think being able to get lost in something like that still has value. So I, I think there's still, I personally think there's still a future for it. It may not be as ubiquitous or as supreme as other media, but I think it'll be there. I think it will actually, I think it'll actually be there. Uh, Solange, the, <laughs> Solange the first, I like your comment. She writes, dang, Ginger Rogers look good. I mean, you got to take care of yourself. And yes, she did indeed. And yes, I appreciate the comment that Fred Astaire was Ginger Rogers' dancing partner because, you know, that expression, she did everything Fred Astaire did just backwards and in heels. So clearly had a tougher job. In terms of colorization, 
Lloyd on YouTube. Hello, Lloyd. Thank you for being part of the chat. Lloyd wrote, perspective is a funny thing. Colorizing changes the history of a film to me. I get that. I get that. Dark Forever Clear also wrote, I find that when I've seen colorized versions of the black and white movies, I don't have that same feeling. I think the wardrobes and such do something with the mood of the movie. Color takes it away a lot. You know what else I think makes a difference is the fact that a movie is in black and white. And I think the black and white makes the nature of shade and shadow more vital than the colorization of the film. I think when you're talking about variations of black and white, then every variation of that one color spectrum has much more meaning than variations of every color. So to me, it makes a bigger difference in a black and white movie than it would make in a color movie, just in terms of like the, the artistic, the aesthetics of, of watching that kind of a movie. We'll continue with the Ben Mankiewicz chat in just a second, but first I wanna show you one of the early documents from TCM before they launched in 1994. And I think it's, it's kind of cool that they wrote this down. When the network launched, they came up with a mantra, the TCM mantra. And I found a scan of it online from the very beginning of Turner Classic Movies. And it goes into what TCM's goal is. It says, among other things, our mission is to turn fans into zealots, casual viewers into fans, and newcomers into the classic movie lovers of the future. It did note from the very beginning that TCM is proud to play a unique role in American culture. It also noticed that, it, obviously, that it would express unconditional love of classic movies and provide unrivaled pleasure and satisfaction. TCM will always be smart, fun, cinematic, and trend-setting. But then the bottom line, I think, is sort of the, the summary that kind of hits the nail fully on the head. The bottom line of the statement reads, TCM believes that movies matter. TCM is dedicated to the art of the film, the value of movies, and the intelligence of our audience. We accept the responsibility of advancing the art and commerce of classic movies. Without TCM, classic movies will die, and with them, part of our culture. TCM is the guardian of classic movies, the keeper of a cultural flame. I think this is important, partly because... It gives the audience a shared sense of vitality for what they're doing. One of the things I used to say to audiences when I would talk about NPR, back when I was a host on NPR, in terms of the future of it, I would ask them, if NPR went away tonight, what would you miss about it tomorrow? If it went away tonight, what would you miss tomorrow? And you could feel a collective... <gasps> from the people I was talking to, but that's the point. And I think that's why something like TCM is such a touchstone, because people realize that, like, I don't want to live without this in my world. I think that makes it very easy for people to connect across their differences, whatever those differences might be, and just kind of let that stuff go in the face of this larger intrinsic value that we share. And I think a lot of our conversations about culture, politics, democracy, the future of America, and on and on and on. They're too shallow because they seek, they, they, they fail to connect with what's collectively important. Like what would you miss about X if it went away tonight? What would you miss tomorrow? If, if all these movies were inaccessible, what would you miss? And even now with streaming, some of them you can't get because the rights aren't there. They haven't been acquired and licensed like Ben was talking about. It's still hard to get some of these movies. And I think maybe that's a way in, in terms of preservation, in terms of the things that matter. And also, I do love this phrase, the intelligence of our audience, being able to look someone in the eye and not just play on their emotions, but say, I think you're smart enough to actually make a move on this that's reasoned and heartfelt. I think we can do both. We can speak to your head and your heart, and I don't have to just kind of make you turn off your brain so that I can drag you around wherever I want to go. If we take this trip together, it'll be much more fun, and it'll be a lot more meaningful. That's what I take from it. And I think that might open doors for different kinds of conversations about all kinds of things to get past what divides us to those common needs that unite us and then work on those things, especially with the things we love. 
We'll get back into part two of the conversation with Ben Mankiewicz. Please do keep putting your comments in the chat. I'll keep going through them, and we'll get to a few more in a few minutes. But for now, let's get back to my chat with TCM primetime host Ben Mankiewicz. Because you kind of work in a uniquely preservationist space, I wonder what your sense is of whether or not people get the need to carry the old into the new for context, or whether people are sort of like, oh, but we can have a a new thing. It's cute that the old thing existed, but I would rather play with the new thing. So, so somebody just told me about that the Japanese are particularly great at this, of honoring old, but turning it into something new that still honors the old. And I don't know that much about it, but I was very struck by the conversation that happened just at the end, tail end of last week, that they'll take a, a you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong here, but uh, they'll take an, an old hotel was the example that was given that, that, you know, needed to be updated, but was a fixture in whatever town that it was in, whatever city it was in. And so they turned it into a new hotel. They, they, they'll, they'll honor the past and they will sort of have elements in the new design that respects the past, but they move forward and they don't wring their hands about it the way we do. Um, so, uh, and I sort of respect that as long as, uh, assuming that that theory about preserving the old in the new exists. Um, you know, part of the problem is our, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anybody, our, our, somewhat carelessness with terms you know i don't know what people will respect i just need enough people to respect the old movies right i mean we're not going to win over everybody and 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 we don't it was pointless to try i mean you know uh uh you know the knock on bill clinton early in his well like maybe throughout his among the knocks on bill clinton but i mean one of them politically was that this guy didn't know you know, he promised he like he like he didn't like people not to like him. He wanted to win a hundred percent of the vote, right? Um, you know, but you know, you need to win fifty and one person in general. In America, of course, turns out you need to win about fifty three percent because you you got to win the right states because we right. have a that's a whole other conversation. Crazy, <laughs> a crazy system. It's so dumb. But we won't um, get into that. We won't <laughs> that's get into a, that. that's another hour long um, conversation for another oh day. My God, hours and hours. Right? Yeah. So, um, but. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we just need to have enough people who care about it, because what we have learned is, is that uh, is that the, one of the great things about TCM and I use this line a lot, but man, I like it. You know, there when you say, hey, man, do you what, what are you what are you watching on TV? No one in the history of the world has ever said, oh, man, I, uh, I watch uh, Showtime. I love Showtime. Anything on Showtime. Right. That's a crazy thing to say. I watch, oh, you know what I love? ABC, right? That's nonsense. No, you might like a show on Showtime or ABC, right? One of my best friends is on Billions. I like Billions. <laughs> you know, I've liked a lot of shows on Showtime, but I don't like Showtime. That's just where stuff is, right? Um, the TCM is an identifier for people. It is a badge of honor. It is the... You know, it's like being a Green Bay Packers fan, right? It's like, uh, you know, it's it's a it's it's like being a Yankee fan. It's a cub, like a Cubs fan, almost more than anything, right? Where you're like, no man, I'm a Cubs fan, and I take all the heartache that goes with. It's like being an NPR listener. You kind of you it's, it's, like, yeah, it's so right. you put on your shield to identify your tribe, who you're 100%, with. And I think it's and I think our identification is even more than NPR. And I'm I going wrong. I love NPR, but that's a good one. You're right. That's exactly right. And but. TCM fans will on their social media pages identify themselves as, you know, wife, mom, lawyer, TCM fan, right? You'll see that sort of thing. That doesn't happen with any other channel on television, um, save maybe for news channels sometimes, but I don't probably have a lot in common with those people. Um, so these movies to get to what keeps us together in this sort of in these incredibly polarizing times where it's tempted to think that, 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 that people who live two doors down for you or two towns over, or, or just people you see in the news, but they're Americans. And we think, man, they come, they not, what, what, what are they reading? What are they saying? How they have, we have nothing and I have nothing in common with them. I do not, their point of view is madness and I want nothing to do with it. There are the things we always fall back on. I get, I got news for you. Those, those people, uh, love their dogs and love their children and want their kids to have a better life than they do. And they want to have uh, opportunity and they want to feel safe. 
those are all things that I want also, right? Um, so the movies, these movies, and I've certainly learned this because I don't even really know what the breakdown politically of our audience is. I have no idea. I always imagine it's pretty close to 50-50, right? But it is nice to recognize that no matter where you come from or what you believe or who you voted for in 2020 and who you're planning to vote for coming up, uh, that you both love Random Harvest, right? <laughs> you you both love uh, Casablanca. Right. Uh, and you, you and you both think, no, I don't want to. I, 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 Ted Turner may have had a nice idea and, and, and he is the reason this channel exists, but they don't colorize these movies. That's great, right? Um, so I, I uh, that's that's comforting to work at a place that one matters to people and two, no question brings people together. I mean, the number of people uh, I'll wrap this up in a second. I'm sorry. Run it that's on. Okay. The number of people who have come to me and and it's, I, I can't count any longer who've said I couldn't stand another moment of watching the news. I didn't want to read the paper. I just wanted to feel OK. So I watched these movies, which in their head. It works the same thing for me, right or wrong. Well, mostly wrong. They think that it represents a time when there weren't these problems. That's wrong. Those problems were very much in existence and there were whole problems that were much worse in many ways than the problems we have now. But they represent nostalgia, represents a good feeling you had when you were younger or a connection to the past of people you care about and love, whether it's your folks, right. your grandparents, you know, that 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 feeling that matters and that is universal you dig in on that when you said i just want to feel okay dig in on that a little bit in terms of the nature of the nostalgia which is one of the things i wanted to ask you about but also i think that tcm i also saw disney plus did this with some of their older films and cartoons tcm in particular did a really good job with gone with the wind I think I, I, Gone with the Wind is one of my favorite movies. I think as a film, it's amazing. Obviously, it's problematic, but I think you kind of n don't see another, like there's a few movies on that scale of that, like How the West Was One giganto film that there are very few of. But I think the way that TCM did it, particularly on the app with the movie, the intro, the long panel discussion that digs into all of the issues, but allowing it to exist in that form and giving people a way to look at it without flinching, I thought was super useful and very powerful. And I wish more of us knew how to do that with more issues in this country, because I think it'd be easier for us to deal with one another. You know what I'm saying? Like, instead yeah. of creating some weird hagiography hey, of what existed, or instead of just canceling it and pretending it never existed, there's a third way that I think classic film has taught us how to do pretty well. And I wish more of us could apply those lessons to, to different aspects of life. Is there something about that approach that you think is replicable that might help the rest of us kind of deal with all these other fault lines that we're trying to walk around? Well, first, let me say how enormously comforting it is to hear you say that. Um, that means a lot because we spent a lot of time spent a lot of time wringing our hands about specifically gone with the wind. And then this reframed series about what we, that's what we thought of it as reframing these movies. Um, because we had, you know, we knew uh, line item one was we can't stop showing gone with the wind. It's too important historically, uh, regardless of what you think of it as a film, it changed the industry completely, you know, Selznick showed other filmmakers, other producers, other directors, he obviously produced the film, that, man, what you thought you could do with this art form, uh, you have no idea, right? And so it just matters historically, right? And then in the first 10 seconds of the film, basically, and I'm barely paraphrasing, they're like, slavery was awesome. Right. Pretty and much. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, remember how great it was. Everybody was happy. It was terrific. Right. So I have, um, you know, look, I, I know uh, the, the historical importance of Gone with the Wind. And after that one, uh, after one of those panel conversations, by the way, um, I think it's the one that we 
that we include in that was um, like there is an appreciation uh, for the the uh, the 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 powerful sexual politics of Scarlett O'Hare. Right. This woman in an era, both when the film was made and certainly when the film was set uh, of of disempowering women and and that this headstrong w- woman took charge of her own destiny. Right. Um, and and that that's a whole other way of looking at the movie, which I had never really looked at particularly before. That was eye opening to me and made me see the film in a different light uh, because I don't like it. Um, I think it's very long. <laughs> well, it's undeniably very long. And I can't get past it. I mean, the first time I saw The Crawl, I, I, I don't even remember what era it was. I, don't, I certainly wasn't working at TCM. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, wh- wh- what? what is this? Do people, and do, wait, you're telling me this is the greatest movie ever made, right? So, but that's part of this wonderful conversation. And and the number, and every year at the festival, uh, we, you know, I meet more and more people uh, like you who, who are like, love the film and are super appreciative that that we did this the danger in it is that is to one we want to make sure that that the movie still gets shown we also want to be able at times to introduce it without going into all this right you know you, some things you're always going to have to say I mean, i'm always i don't i'm not going to do an intro to gone with the wind without mentioning slavery or at least directing them to Jacqueline Stewart's really brilliant introduction of the film Jacqueline Stewart who's uh, one of the TCM hosts and and, and she did that that intro and she's uh i mean she basically controls hollywood now uh she, she's the uh uh director uh of the uh, academy director and president of the academy museum and she's a tcm host and she's by far the smartest host it's not even it's not really close it's not fair she's a professor um and so the uh she did a great job so we also though on a lesser level than canceling the movie which we don't want to do is we also don't want to make people feel bad if they like it, right? Like you're allowed to like go on with the wind. It's okay, right? Because the movie makes you feel certain things. And to get to your the heart of your question, it is okay to like this movie. And I hope people instantly don't think, oh, here are these people telling me how I'm supposed to think. No, nope, we're not telling you how we think. We're hoping to give you a little extra perspective. And I hope at the end you go, well, I, I didn't get all that. That makes some sense. I still love Gone with the Wind. And now I have this, context on top of it and it's okay and those things they can live side by side well and else i also feel like if if we don't have these kinds of preservationist spaces you sort of can't make those conversations if you just cancel it you know like i've mentioned starship troopers before we know how wildly dystopian the future is where it's like Managed democracy is the term, which I didn't know until I started playing Helldivers 2, and I was like, oh, that's a thing. Like, that idea of that super patriotic democracy that is clearly not a free state at all, but I need that movie to be able to laugh at the idea of something that would be horrific for us, and it makes it okay to engage with without feeling like I have to vote a certain way or avow a certain thing. I think that's part of why I kind of struggled with the pushback to the movie Barbie and people being like, oh, I can't believe that this is a movie that's against men. I was like, if you come out of that movie defending patriarchy, I think there's a deeper conversation we need to have. But if they never made the movie, we couldn't have it. And I feel like part of... I just remember Ben Shapiro was like, you know, he said they use the term patriarchy uh, 10 times in the movie and never once is it ironic. And I was like, Dude, at, at uh, he uh, 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 Ryan Gosling used it as a verb. Right, it was ironic every time. Right. right, it was thoughtful. I mean, it was thoughtful every time, and many times it was ironic. I don't know what movie well, you saw. Well, and I also came yeah. away from. I did. A, I did an episode of the podcast where I talk about what I believe the real villain of the Barbie movie was, and it was not patriarchy. It was something else. But I think if, and that was what really struck me with the. I mean, it brought tears to my eyes because when I got it, I was like, oh my god, I see myself in Barbie. I understand this very differently now. And I I feel like that's kind of, for me anyway, I I don't know if other people who watch TCM like me are like, oh my God, I just love TCM. I wish I could just like be a host and like have the, the, the spirit of Robert Osborne all about me. But I feel like it kind of gives me a way to talk about things that are really hard to talk about, to embody things that are really hard to embody without saying, 
let's have a conversation about the evils of a totalitarian government. Let's just watch Starship Troopers. Or let's have a conversation about the problems with the media and the and the you know the television industry and and how we grind people up. Let's just watch network, right? Let's just get kind of lost in Patty Shayevsky's screenplay for a minute and then have that conversation. It's almost like TCM makes some of these conversations potentially a hell of a lot easier to have because you don't have yeah. to start with either one of us. We can start with some outside thing that embodies the conversation and then have the conversation from a place that's not quite so so personal and so raw. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's amazing how we sort of, you know, I don't know that we, I, I think it's fair to say that when we signed on the air in 1994, we didn't anticipate, you know, this moment, you know, this conversation would happen 30 years later between a host who you're going to regret hiring and, you know, uh, and Joshua Johnson. Um, <laughs> oh, so, I don't know that they would regret. Oh, don't, don't be nice. No, no, be nice to yourself, Ben Mankiewicz. No, they uh, uh, it took a little bit, but they they came around. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, I'm talking about the audience. The audience took a little bit to come around to me. But, you know, because I wasn't Robert. Um, and that's that's in many ways, that's understandable. Um, so. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, that we got that we're in this position now, right? We're sort of we're in a kind of where, where we don't need to talk about sort of the, you know, the corporatization, the, 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 the consumerism of the media now and that we don't need to have this this highbrow conversation and hand wringing conversation about it that we or at least we do need to have it. But I mean, we can start by uh, we start by just watching network, as you say, and the fact that you can include that we can watch network on TCM and get a little context about the film, right? About what was happening in in, in the early to mid nineteen seventies that 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 planted a seed in Patty Chayefsky's mind that he saw the future, right? That he was you know forty years early, right? Thirty years early. Um, so same thing with uh, you know face in the crowd in 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 nineteen fifty seven and 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 Bud Schulberg script and the Ilya Kazan movie Ilya Kazan movie that uh, you know with Andy Griffith, so both both these media films that just saw a future that you can't. It's a, amazing to me how you, this again. I I don't think I ever use the word prescient except when talking about network and a face in the crowd. Um, so and that we have a role to play in that. Uh, at TCM, again, it gets to this point of, I can't believe I have a job in this, you know, television is stupid. <laughs> um, there's a lot of great stuff, but it's pretty dumb. And, you know, I started as a journalist there in my, that's when I was in Miami and I was in Charleston, South Carolina before that. And I thought I'd be a television journalist my whole life, but I grew to hate it. I couldn't wait to get out. Um, and the notion that I would land a job in television as a host. I mean, sometimes when people introduce me at events or functions that I'm at. And, and even if I, you know, have sent word or tried to get them not to, and it's always okay. I'm grateful to be included in anything. But when they say, you know, a television personality, Ben Mankiewicz, I'm always like, ah, oh. like there's nothing. <laughs> it's that there's nothing, painful. Oh my God. I'm it's just, that I bad. Always think, I'm like, I, I, people who are described as television personalities are uh, morons. Uh, that's me. Um, I mean, where's the lie? You're not right. okay. Proceed, proceed. Um, so I always say, you know, they always say, you know, they, 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 my bio is like two and a half minutes long, and I'm always like, just say TCM host. I'm good. TCM host Ben Magwitz. It's enough. It's enough. So the fact that I have a job in this uh, in this big picture broadcasting, you know, uh, that in what I love to do, that's what I see myself ultimately as as a broadcaster. Um, that I have this job. Um, for a place that matters, like I have a, I, 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 I got a job in television that matters to people and that might, God, it feels crazy. That feels like I'm patting myself on the back or, but it's really patting TCM on the back at a place that matters. Right. Um, is, uh, I, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Cause there's, there's just so few of these jobs and, uh, um, that we have a role to play in the conversations that you're talking about and to, that a role to play in, in, in many ways, teaching people about uh, American history, world history, Hollywood history. Yeah. Even in these little two minute segments, we put these movies into their historical and Hollywood context. Um, you know, 
I mean, I was a history major, so I love it. I love it. I just find it incredibly exciting on a, on a, on a routine basis. We'll get to part three of our conversation with Ben Mankiewicz in just a moment. Uh, I, yeah, we, we, we did have a good time talking about TCM. And I appreciate you putting your comments into the chat. Joseph, I saw your comments on YouTube, and I appreciate you saying, your exchange on nostalgia is so smart. We should use classic film to think critically about today's world and its issues along with the comfort and fun aspect. Thank you for that. That's exactly why I think it's valuable. I mean, I, I think it it's almost like, particularly from, you know, for me as a younger person who got into classic film in my teens, early teens, it was sort of a window on a world that I didn't know. And I think just the opportunity to make context for something I didn't have context for was really fun. I mean, my first classic movie was when I was in seventh grade, so 13 years old, West Side Story. I didn't know a movie could have an overture, a really long overture where there's no movement and just a solid image. And then, you know, just the orchestra. Pum, 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 I didn't know that that's what movies did. So then, and then the dance sequence afterward with the. That was brand new to me. I was not ready for that. But I think because it kind of peeled open a different kind of strand of life that I wasn't aware of. It just sort of sucked me in. And I had the conversation in class to sort of understand what was going on. And so that was that was valuable for me. That was super valuable for me. I see Dark Forever Clear, one of your other comments, wrote on YouTube, I find them like a history book that we should read to remember how far we've come and how far we still need to go. Kids need to know how things used to be. Yes, that's exactly what West Side Story did for me. That's what a number of films did for me. And that's also what I think movies like Malcolm X did for me. Malcolm X was an eye-opening film for me. It just, it kind of flipped open for me what a movie could be and how powerful a film about the black experience could be. At a time when everybody in the early 90s was wearing X caps, I took something completely different from that film because I felt it as a movie as well as kind of a cultural statement that just, it just hit very different. It hit very, very different for me. I, uh, <laughs> and Pam, I see your comment. That's the same face that Joshua has when he says content creator. Yeah, that whole, <laughs> that whole thing about like TV people being morons. I, or personalities. Yeah, I feel that, I feel that. Um, although I will never not chuckle at, <laughs> at the face that Ben made when he was like, whew. Slavery was awesome. I, I think I, that will that will cross my mind on a day when I'm having a really bad day and I'm gonna giggle. Just so you know, I'm gonna giggle. When we come back, we'll talk about the future of TCM and some of the very moving ways in which Ben has seen it affect people's lives before we go.
Back again to our conversation with TCM primetime host Ben Mankiewicz. Just TCM host Ben Mankiewicz. I think he prefers that we keep it very simple. Glad to have all of you in the conversation today. Remember, nightlightjoshua.com is your source for all things related to the nightlight. You can always email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. If you know someone who might have enjoyed this interview, who maybe couldn't watch live, who couldn't take part, send them the link. Go to the YouTube page at Nightlight Joshua. Click on the link. Remember, when a live stream ends, it instantly becomes a YouTube video. So you can click the exact same link that if you're watching on YouTube that you're watching right now, that link will still work if you share it out to somebody else. So maybe you know a classic movie fan or or someone who is just trying to think differently about the way that we bridge some of our cultural divides. Go to our YouTube page, share this very video with someone else and see if they might get some value from this as well. All right. It's Friday. I should let you go soon, but I do want to get you to the last part of our conversation. You may remember that not too long ago, there was concern about the future of TCM as a channel after its parent company, Warner Media, got acquired by David Zaslav, who was the guy who founded Discovery Communications. They merged into a company called Warner Brothers Discovery with an enormous amount of debt that he took on, that Zaslav took on, to make the merger happen tens of billions of dollars of debt to make the acquisition happen. And one of the early possible targets for cuts was Turner Classic Movies. A number of executives at TCM left. There were some cutbacks. A number of things changed really across the entire portfolio, but especially the Warner part of Warner Brothers Discovery. And a lot of Hollywood heavyweights went to David Zaslav and were like, Freeze, <laughs> you're not doing this, including Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Paul Thomas Anderson, and others. And Zaslav was able to mend some fences in Hollywood as a result of the concerns over what would happen to TCM. That whole guardian of classic film thing, Hollywood took that very seriously, and Zaslav responded. So I wanted to make sure that I asked Ben about that and about how TCM's future looks today. There was a lot of hue and cry out of Hollywood when David Zaslav acquired Warner Brothers as part of the merger between Warner Media and Discovery. There were cutbacks, and there you know, Hollywood directors Steven Spielberg and Scorsese and others, Paul Thomas Anderson, went to David Zaslav and were like, "Freeze!" And there was a big push to kind of save TCM and rally around this channel. How do things look at TCM now? Does it look like the channel is healthy for the future? Um. Yes, I think it looks like the channel is healthy for the future. We lost some really good people, but I think that we're in a better place than we've ever been. Um, some of that had to do with that hue and cry. It was nice. I got to say, man, you know, that hue and cry didn't come out of, you know, David Zaslav in a very short period of time became sort of the the face of, of uh, you know, I mean, first of all, nobody likes studio executives in general, right? And it's a generally fairly unpopular group of people easily made fun of and he became the face of that very very quickly which is a, a testament to his skilled stewardship of his company i mean he's been there a long time because he delivers on what he says he's going to deliver on and he's incredibly smart and i got news for you uh joshua he loves tcm i mean i i, I know it because i got texts from him before any of this happened when he was just watching again and again where he just thought something was cool that happened on the air. I don't want to suggest that we're like close friends or anything. We're not. But, and then when, when, you know, they have a way of running this company, the way of running their company, which has worked. And, and it's the way almost every big company in this media company gets run. Right. And, and they want to streamline and save money where they can. Uh, you know, they had like $50 billion plus in debt. Right. You got to pare that down. You just have to, right. That's, that's capitalism. And that's a whole, again, it's another conversation, right? But um, so when he, that hue and cry came and those three directors leading a much larger group, you know, but Paul Tom Sanderson, Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, went to him in peace, like they're, they all work with him. They like the, the, the you know, they're, they're friends with him. And they were like, David, uh, TCM's different and we need you to recognize that it's different. And he did. And I, I don't know, man, to me, that's, I mean, I'm cynical. So at, at nature at, about big business things, because ultimately, you know, it's all about the money. Right. So and he listened to these guys and listened to, you know, all these film lovers 
who made it clear and all these journalists who made it clear uh, how important TCM was and that they need we need it we, we can't quite get run like every other network we are definitely subjected to the same market forces as other television channels but we need to be run a little bit differently because we are the only people who are the the guardians of this great cultural heritage right and other other people preserve films but we're the only people who 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 play a role in that preservation and then exhibit them on television uncut commercial free as they were meant to be seen so they need to treat that a little bit differently and he, david and and his team saw it and recognized it and stepped up and you know it didn't fully change course but they changed course they 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 and that i don't know that to me that is literal leadership so i i had no problem saying that yeah i i, I mean i would work for that guy forever uh, um so you know they i think we are in great 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 position uh going forward and and maybe in some strange way uh better off than than we would have been one other thing i wanted to ask you about because i've had this argument with people who love film and i want to be able to say ben mankowitz agrees with me so I'm going to see if you agree with me. Years ago, I had a conversation mm -hmm. with someone at a workplace, a young intern, new hire, whatever. And we were talking about classic movies. And they were like, oh, well, I've never seen a classic movie. What should I watch? And some of the other folks around were like, Criterion yeah, Collection, yeah. Fellini, Kurosawa. And I was like, freeze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is not where you start if you've never seen a black and white movie. And they were like, but Joshua, these movies are very important. And it's just a very smart young man. And we don't want to dumb film down for him. He's a very bright. I was like, blah, 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 blah. The first five ones you should see are, in my opinion, Casablanca. If you've never seen a black and white movie, start with Casablanca. It's the classics classic. Then see, and it's also bite size. It's not the length of Gone with the Wind. Then see Singing in the Rain, because it's fun. Then see Citizen Kane. Then, because you've already got a Humphrey Bogart in there, otherwise I'd say Maltese Falcon, get a different noir film, see Sunset Boulevard. And then, to mix it up, put a thriller in there and see Psycho. Start with those five, and then reevaluate and go in any direction you want. And, and of course, they got Huffy. Then like, you can see some great, and you can see Seven Samurai, and right. you can see Rashomon, right? Then right. you can see Bicycle Thieves, And they were like, right. oh, but classic uh, film is such as amazing. It's just aesthetic, it's a tradition, and we have to preserve, and the intellectuals. Like, no, no, movies gotta, are also entertainment. Like, entertain the kid. So I, I just want to be able to say that Ben Mankiewicz agrees with me. So I don't sort of agree with you. I 100% agree with you. And while my five films might be slightly different, they also might not be. Like, that is a... That is a top five that I would be like, yeah, okay, great, sold, <laughs> you know, um, uh, and you get the Citizen Kane poster behind me, which you'll see because you can't find it. Well, I'm sure you can't. There's no zooming in in this day and age, but uh, my my wife, God bless her, right above the Citizen Kane there uh, wrote in Sharpie screenplay by Herman Mankiewicz because <laughs> it's not on the poster. It's my grandpa. <laughs> um, the, uh, so that's a very valuable one. It's the it's only one of a kind. Um uh, so yeah, but even if you take, I don't need, I don't need one of my family's movies, uh, in there. Uh, you know, you could take uh, Citizen Kane out. You could take it, put it in another B Billy Wilder film. You could put Ace in the Hole. You could put, by the way, I would say in many ways, I, I'd put uh, Face in the Crowd in there. You know, if you, that's a, a media, great media movie that has every bit the impact of, uh, of network. So you're exactly right. Those are great, great picks. Um, and they're, you know, they're arguably, five of the 20 best movies ever made that makes me you have no idea you have no idea how many people who love tcm who love you who love classic movies who are going to just give me a, that's just the fact that you agreed with me that's worth at least 15 points and i am I, there I, I will tell you that all five tcm hosts would have said you know of course everybody's five would be and it's not really a top five it's a five that you should see right that will have an impact on you and 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 the, while they may have given different ones there's not a dave carger alicia malone jacqueline stewart eddie muller i'm just imagining eddie eddie would be like yeah okay yeah what, <laughs> what do you want me to say yeah <laughs> that's the list great that's great. it yeah <laughs> that's yeah. it that's it before yeah. i let you go i do want to since you brought up kind of the meaning that TCM has for people. And clearly it does, because if you're gonna buy tickets to a film festival or go on a cruise, like you must really love this community of people. I feel like we're in a moment culturally where we're really 
deep into our communities, whether it's, and I don't mean political factions, I mean like sports teams or fandoms yeah, sure. or, you know, our other avocational communities because the world just feels like a lot right now and because we're sort of bracing for 2025, whatever happens politically. And classic film feels like very much a port in the storm in that. You talked about people wanting to just feel okay in that. And I wonder just where you see that going in terms of the role of film, of art, of entertainment to get us through whatever's whatever's coming. TCM's not going anywhere. We don't know where the hell the world's gonna go. But, and I have some optimism in terms of the capacity, in terms of the tools being there for us to get one another through whatever's gonna happen. I just don't know that enough other people, A, believe that, or B, realize they kind of have the tools to get through it, particularly through art, particularly through things like film. But I know you said you're more of a cynical person. Maybe I'm the wrong person to ask you this, but I wonder before no, I let you I go mean, how you see it. I'm cynical about the how we get out of the cycle that we're in as a country, right? I don't, I can't quite see it. Um, it doesn't mean I don't think we will. I just can't see it. Um, and I spend a fair amount of time thinking about it. I mean, once we, once we entered into a world where there was just this open acknowledgement that, that disinformation, that intentional disinformation works, um, like how do you snap out of that? I think you just get better at disinformation. Right. Um, so, and that's just a small little thing. So, I mean, that's a big thing, but a small aside, it's a huge, maybe the most important thing that we have to deal with. Um, I think that, you know, that said, we get back to some of what we talked about in the beginning. This it, it is it sounds like a cliche because it is a cliche. But as my father used to tell me, there's a lot of truth in cliches before you dismiss them all. <laughs> think about what's really in there. Right. Um, so we do have much more in common than what tears us apart. Sometimes what tears us apart is so big that it's unrecoverable. But again, we have the same, many, most of us have the same hopes and desires, needs, wants, and fears. Um, and, there, you know, again, you mentioned sports, right? I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a moderately compulsive gambler and a huge sports fan. And uh, I do not think that only people who agree with me about politics share that, <laughs> right? You know, um, so there are so many things that can bring us together. And the movies, this is great art form that, that this country has been the most influential and, and powerful producer of throughout its 100 plus year history, the art form, not the country, um, uh, can play a big role in that, right? Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, we, I'm going to learn at the festival coming up in the middle of April, one for the 15th time, um, you know, uh, what the what these movies do for people and how they comfort people um how they help people through some of the most difficult times in their lives whether it's their own illness or the illness of a parent or god forbid a child um or a friend uh that watching those movies i got stopped in a a, a, a laundromat uh 10 days ago um by a woman who waited for me to come back out and who just said you know, I lost my mom four months ago, but I, I went back home and I spent most of the last 14 months of her life as she was sick with her every day. And, um, and we, all we did, we just watched TCM every day. We'd watch a movie, two movies, three movies, four movies, talk about, she'd talk about when she saw them, what it meant to her. Some of the movies I remember seeing with her, some of them were new to me. And she goes, I just wouldn't trade those 14 months for everything. I miss her every day, but I wouldn't change for anything. And they're thanking me for that. You know, I didn't have anything to do with that. Um, but I'm here and I represent that place and I'm, it's a man, it takes, you know, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. It's a, it's a powerful place to be. And if we, uh, take a, take some more deep breaths, um, and again, this all sounds so trite and cliche, but if we take a couple more deep breaths, um, before we condemn everybody who doesn't agree with us or call them names or pigeonhole them as fools or morons, a word I used earlier in this conversation, Joshua, um, uh, then we, uh, we might slowly, slowly, slowly be able to pull ourselves back 
to an era where we just disagree, uh, as opposed to uh, condemn everyone who is not on our side. That doesn't sound trite or cliched at all. That actually feels very hopeful. Well, I, I mean, I am, I am hopeful. I don't know how optimistic I am. Uh, certainly not in the immediate future, but uh, you know, the, uh, the road is long. Um, uh, and to quote Bruce Springsteen, and the road is long and seeming without end. Um, so that, that, that actually serves our purpose in this conversation. Ben Mankiewicz, primetime host of TCM. The network is celebrating its 30th anniversary all month. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have had time to talk to you about all these things and to be proven right. I won't say it's the best part of our conversation, but I will count it as a highlight. Thank you so very much for making time for me. I really appreciate it. I, I very much enjoyed it. Anytime. This was unexpected and a treat. Thank you. My conversation with Ben Mankiewicz. I loved talking to him. I really appreciate the point he made at the end. And I, I understand why it was so moving. I think it is an easy thing to forget when we get so sort of in our feelings about politics and culture, understandably, legitimately, right? The political divides we have are not a bug of democracy. They're a feature. We're supposed to work through the things that we disagree about. I hear him in terms of misinformation and disinformation. And if you've watched the show, you know, I am not shy about discussing those things. But I think that's also why I've been trying consciously to not make this show about politics all the time, right? I, it, was one, it was one of the things that I don't miss about being an anchor on MSNBC. I don't miss having to shoehorn other things in alongside that sky is falling feeling. And I do see the necessity as the people who have spoken to Ben, as he related there so movingly at the end, I see the necessity for some balance. I feel like we all need a little balance. And more to the point of not just balance, but equilibrium. Does that make sense? That we need more of a sense of not just being balanced, but knowing how to rebalance, how to find balance when life feels tilted. And I think that things like art, music, books, movies, even video games, concerts, museums, festivals. They're one of those things that we can go to and not forget our problems, but remember our humanity. I think that's more to the point. I think that's why these artworks have a place. Not to help us forget our problems, but to remember our humanity. That's what makes them powerful to me. Let me get to a few more of your comments and then I will release you for the weekend. Joseph, I see a while ago, you wrote on YouTube, cultural touchstone, in my opinion, that is nice if it happens, but it's not necessary. My concern is the infrastructure of filmmaking and especially distribution and marketing business supporting niche work. I hear you on that too. I think that the infrastructure on a really big level for like the mega movies, that is a much more difficult thing. I mean, a lot of the studios that made a lot of movies years ago aren't making as many movies per year as they did. They're still making some really great movies. I think the difference now is, you know, you can, you can make a film on your phone if you want to. Whether you can make a great film on your phone or with a cast of thousands is another matter. But at least the technology exists for people to kind of dive in and make whatever they want to make. I get to make my own show, and I didn't have to wait for another network to pick me up after NBC let me go. I'm here in my second bedroom in my apartment. So, you know, I, I, I kind of love the fact that the technology exists for me to market and distribute what I want to make. The trick is trying to surface it. And I think that's the issue with the cultural touchstone thing that I totally resonate with, Joseph, in your comment, because I'm having... I'm, I know how much trouble I have just trying to get people to find the show and to encounter it, even though I had a larger venue once. Once that shifts, like the algorithms are not kind <laughs> to work like this. So I can only imagine how hard it is when you're an independent filmmaker or a small filmmaker, or a shoestring budget filmmaker, even if you make something really, really good, how do you get people to find it, right? That's the hard part. I think in that I, I agree with, with your concern. The infrastructure is there. I think the 
piece of the infrastructure that gets in the way is the algorithm. It's social media. But you can still pay for advertising, and then you can very specifically target precisely who you want. You just got to do it for a price. Maybe in that way it's better so that you don't have to pay for a studio to pay the executives and the staffers to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to market your movie. You can spend thousands of dollars in very targeted social media advertising to market the movie. So maybe in that regard it might be better you're still competing with the noisiest voices in the room. And it's harder to kind of get at those mega sources of attention, but those would be expensive anyway. Those would be hard to access in the 80s or the 90s or the 70s. So I don't know, maybe it's a mix. It's, it's a little bit better, it's a little bit harder. It's, I don't know, maybe it's a bit of a blend, but there's gotta be a way forward. There's gotta be a future for it. And, and those of us who are smaller creators of television or movies or, or dance or film or music or anything else, we find our way. You know, you find your way. I'm also glad that so many of you liked the conversation. Dark Forever Clear, glad you thought it was a fascinating interview. Thank you, Gene. I'm glad that you enjoy it. And yes, I agree with you, Gene. TCM does have a very special place for a lot of us. I really appreciate that. Also, Marriott 3, I see you joined the chat, and I'm not sure why this font got so, rah, so very big all of a sudden. Oh my goodness. It's freaking out on me. Whoa, that, that's, I've never seen this software do that before. I wonder if I can get it under control. This is not the way that I want company to see my show behaving. Be nice for company. Oh my God, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read it from the side of my screen. Those of you listening to the audio podcast later, it's hilarious how technology just embarrasses me in front of company. Mariette 3 wrote, I'm so happy YouTube recommended this video to me. I'm so glad to have discovered your channel and this wonderful interview with one of my favorite people on TV. TCM is home to me. It's my safe place. I hear that. I hear that 100%. And I think that those kind of spaces are, are a special thing when you find them. When you find a place where you can connect, where you feel like you can be yourself, where you feel like you belong and people will welcome you, I think we need to expand those spaces, preferably to roughly the size of the entire United States. We're working on it. We're building a more welcoming space every single day. Hey, thank you for welcoming me into your homes and your lives this week. Remember, you can find me online at nightlightjoshua.com. You can email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe and write a review so more people can find it. Subscribe on the YouTube channel and click the like button if you enjoyed this video. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for me. Enjoy the, your night and your weekend. And until we meet again, please, my friends, keep on shining because someone somewhere needs your light right now. Mm -hmm.